The next type of M&A is an M&A is an extension, and this is where the textbook talks about entering new geographic regions or entering new product markets. Um, in terms of entering new geographic regions, companies do M&As to sometimes overcome the entry barriers associated with legal uh, requirements or of cultural perspectives. For example, when Walmart first entered Japan, it bought a Japan discount store chain, Daiyu was its name, and even though it was Walmart and Walmart was running it, they, they actually chose to keep the company name. But you'll often see companies that will buy uh, companies in the region or they will partner with them, something we'll talk about uh, in a later chapter, because that's the only way the legal restrictions in a country will allow you to enter that new country. The advantage, but it's not always that, sometimes it's just um, you, you want to buy a competitor who's very big in a different section of the country or the world than you are, and particularly when we get away from the Fortune 500 sizes of companies and get it down into the smaller companies, you see companies that will buy up other companies in other parts of the country uh, because they just want to get bigger, but they're, uh, they're, they're moving into new areas. It's not really consolidation, it's I want a new presence uh, in a new area. The advantage of doing it by uh, an M&A versus uh, launching off your new stores or your new operation in these different parts of the world is that it's fast and, um, well, basically that's it. It's that it's fast. You can execute it more cheaply. Um, also, there, it should de-risk it a little bit. They already have market share. It's not like you're going in and you have to assert yourself in the market. You're just buying a quick entry. Same mentality in the product markets. Um, that now you're going and taking a product that you don't already have in your portfolio that, that may not fit as uh, it doesn't call, qualify as a consolidation because it's not just like you've got, you're not taking out a competitor, you're going and buying something new. So you can see this would fit with the diversification strategies that we had in our previous chapter. And again, the sense is, is that it's a lower risk because the product is further along in the R&D chain, lower cost. Uh, because it's there, it may, it may actually already be on the market and already selling. And again, it's quicker is the reason that you do it buying an M&A versus uh, doing it organically. It's important to remember that when you bring these companies in, even though your primary economic logic is you're looking for that extension, you may also be able to do some downsizing that's going to uh, elicit some cost savings. You may also gain some market power that's going to allow you to either drive out some cost or improve your profit margins. Again, uh, put me on pause, go look back on that screen of, of uh, M&As and tell me which of the ones that I've given you would you think would fit into this category. Glad you came back. So uh, certainly uh, ones that jump off at me would be uh, where Lenovo purchased Motorola Mobility. So Lenovo is a Chinese computer company. They purchased Motorola Mobility to make a quick entry into the cell phone market. And part of the reason they're so comfortable doing that is because they've done it once before. Lenovo several years ago bought the laptop business from IPM, IBM, which developed the ThinkPads, and it worked out very well for them. So they were able to get a new brand name, get a very popular brand name, expand into Western markets, and quickly buy the ability to to uh, manufacture laptops, and now they're trying to do the same with uh, the cellular telephones. There are other examples on there, but you can see it's just moving into a new area, moving into a new product market, and doing so quickly. The last one's a little bit trickier, M&A is entrepreneurship. This is where the focus is on learning, obtaining resources, creating synergy with an eye towards the future. Um, this one's, like I say, is harder to identify, so I'm going to give you some examples of ones uh, from the chart. One would be uh, Facebook. They've done some consolidation, or I'm sorry, some extension stuff when Facebook, for example, bought um, Instagram, and I forget whether it was, it was WhatsApp, I think is the name of the new one that they recently bought. But the one that I really think represents entrepreneurship is their purchase of Oculus Rift. Now, Oculus Rift, for which they paid $2 billion, not an insignificant sum of money, is the new virtual reality headset. And so how does that fit into Facebook? Well, you can see they're talking about taking this sharing experience and this immersive experience and taking it to a whole other market, a whole other thought. So you, they're being very entrepreneurial and perhaps trying to develop this market ahead of everyone else. 
Again, these you don't hear of as much because they tend to, uh, they don't have an impact until five or 10 years down the line if they're successful, but they're very important for companies. As you can see, this idea of virtual reality in Facebook is potentially very important. There have been some others. When um, Live Nation, which merged the idea of concert management with being uh, promoters for the stars, they merged the two of them in an entrepreneurial deal where it says, why, do, why are these stovepipes here? Why can't we just bring the event management into a part of star management? And so that was somewhat entrepreneurial. And as far as the basic process goes, these are the steps. And this is where I really like to use the dating analogy. So companies are always on the lookout for what would be good additions. And so this is where they, they talk about their screening targets. They're always looking. So this is like if you're in your online dating websites when you're going, no, 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 hmm, maybe. So now you're screening the targets and then you make the big decision to actually approach the target. And in the M&A world, that approach is very significant because once that is done, um, the track record shows that once the process begins, that M&As usually result. So that's unlike online dating where you go out with uh, a guy or a gal and say, that ain't gonna work. Uh, once you start to court the company, so to speak, uh, there's actually a pretty good completion rate. So now that you've approached the company and you've basically agreed to really check each other out, then you enter into due diligence. And this is where you dive into the company. Usually they get the right to look into your books and the like, and you see, is this, is this company really what I thought it was? And are they worth uh, pursuing the deal with? Then you negotiate the terms of the deal. Then the deal is done and you, become to, you come to the very important step of integration. And I'm gonna talk about using these four steps, why things fall apart in a uh, subsequent slide that will better help you understand these steps. We portray them as like it's very systematic or orderly. It's not always, and it also seems like it would take a long time. And sometimes it does, but sometimes companies can move very quickly. For example, Facebook's acquisition of Oculus Rift was basically no negotiated uh, in a weekend. And part of that was because it's an entrepreneurship deal and because to Facebook, $2 billion isn't real money. Uh, they just, that's kind of chump change. And so they're willing to do a deal of that level fairly quickly. So come back in the next video and we're going to dive into more why do M&As some work and why do some not work. Thanks.